Let's see. All right. That'll do. I think um, this will be our best looking episode yet because <laughs> we have lights. Turned up. <laughs> we actually have lights this time. Yeah. I'm going to take the doge down now because he just doesn't fit. Or actually, I'll just move him over yeah. here. Because it looks really weird in the frame. And doge, it's, yeah. his time is up. So that's that. Camera should be rolling. We can see ourselves. And we've got a pen. Okay, so this was chapters nine and ten. Mm -hmm. Of human action today is what March twenty eighth, two thousand nineteen. Yeah. All right, and you know, to be honest, I didn't read through the study guide. I only read the chapters. So right. let's um, go through the questions and see if we can answer them. Okay. So, section one, human reason. What is the relation between thinking and action? Um, thinking, I think it was, he said that thinking is an action, that, um, you know, to act, one must be considering that it's going to affect a change. You think that it's going to change an outcome. It's going to produce the ends. Yeah. This means it's going to produce the ends that you want. In the chapter, it says, all action is preceded by thinking. Yeah, that makes so. sense. Okay, so... What, why is it always the individual who thinks? Yeah, because groups can't think. An individual is the only one who can think. Right. Bam. What is language? Why is it so important? Oh, this was cool. Language, what is it? Thinking depends on language. Like, you think in a language. And this was something I didn't realize. Like, my stepmom is Korean, but she moved to the U.S., and now she thinks in English. And she's commented about that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how do you think in English? Like... Right. But you do, and words are required for thinking. Like, if you don't have a word for something, you don't have the concept of it, you can't even think of that thing. It's mm -hmm. like a concept can't even exist yeah. without the word for it. Unless you're like a savant and think in like geometry or something. <laughs> yeah, you think in shapes or whatever. Yeah. What? I think in colors. You do? No, I'm just oh, okay. <laughs> what, what stimulates intellectual progress? Oh, it's the standing on the shoulders of giants. Bam. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you didn't invent the words that you think. And, like, you couldn't make as much progress as you had as if you needed to invent all these words or invent all these things. Totally. I think he makes an exception or something here, but... No. Nah, yeah, I mean, that's basically the concept. There's got to be mm -hmm. progress. He goes into... A little bit about what that means that change is not necessarily progress except in the stance of like evolution mm -hmm. like scientific evolution but don't mistake change for progress two worldview and ideology what are the differences between worldview and ideology okay so a worldview is how you see the wor world in so a worldview is more macro, and ideologies are more um, on a on a more dis distinct scale, I believe. What mm -hmm. do you think? Well, I remember him saying that ideologies are accepted without question. Mm -hmm. That ideologies are things like. Um, the person in the army who's like, of course the state is the best, like, that's mm -hmm. awesome, we all love the state, and they can't even imagine someone has a different ideology. Right. But a worldview is a little bit bigger, I think. Like, thinking, okay, you're, if you're, that guy, that person's worldview might be, um, states are necessary for me to prosper or something. Ah. Uh. I, 
Just, I, I keep, uh... I don't know. I don't know the answer to this. What is the difference between worldview and I... Okay, okay. It's a, so a worldview serves as both an interpretation of all things. Right. So, a worldview, you can apply it to everything. Like, you see the entire world through this kind of paradigm. And, okay. But it also as a guide to action. In the sense, a worldview is both an explanation and technology. Ideology is a narrow term in that it restricts attention to human interaction over earthly concerns. Ah. Uh. Okay. Yeah, so I think we covered that pretty good. I'm not sure I still uh, fully understand the difference. A world, can you give me like an example of what the two different things are? like? Okay, so... A worldview... I mean, it, it's definitely hard to say a worldview in like a short thing. But every everything I see, or every in the world, I might think, you know, everything is good. Like, I might have an optimistic uh, worldview. Okay. So, everything that happens, I will see, like, the positive side. Versus maybe have a pessimistic, pessimistic worldview, and everything happens negative. Like everything's more negative. Or an ideology might be. I know they kept, they always talked about like maybe the Nazi ideology. Yeah. Um, that's an ideology because it deals with you know real things like the Nazi who's believed like the extermination of the Jews. Like that's a real. Thing. It's not necessarily like pessimistic and optimistic. It's, it's not on that more abstract scale. Oh, okay. It's more like concrete. Got it. All right. Uh, ideology deals with the real world. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Why is it fallacious to believe that one group can only prosper at the expense of other groups? Yeah, so that's kind of an ideology in one sense. Mm. Um, I, I thought it was fascinating when you talked about um, different I, like ideologies usually have the same um, ends, and where they argue is the means. Like he, the the racist and you know the person who loves inner peace have the same means and their means is for um, their group to prosper but the, the same ends they, they have the same ends yes it is for prosperous but um, the the fallacious part is that you know the racist believes that in order for them to prosper they, it needs to be the detriment of another group right yeah, it's, it's fallacious to believe that one group can only prosper at the expense of other groups because of the Ricardo's, uh, I don't know, theorem yeah. or disc whatever thing that we learned from last chapter where it's like, even if you're the, the worst chef around, you still provide value to the best chef around right. by doing the, the bad jobs, you know, the, the, way, the way, best way you can, free them up. Uh, I noticed this over here in the technical notes um, about ideologies. The Marxists believe that ideologies, except Marxism of course, are simply adapted to justify the economic and social order of a given period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, that ideology is dangerous because you already discount the other group before like anything's happened. Like you just, you, like all of a sudden, the, one group is completely unmoral, like right off the bat, like without even any action. So that's so there's no room for compromise or agreement if you start out with saying the other group is evil. Mm -hmm. So it's like an ideology that cannot like compromise because you know you're immoral if you like compromise with evil. Right, seems like it's important to be aware of ideologies mm -hmm. and when um, one is espousing a worldview or an ideology yeah. and to, to clearly define them. Mises, of course, believes just the opposite, namely that the Industrial Revolution could not occur 
until political and legal reforms gave the people of Western Europe a degree of autonomy from their rulers. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I thought it was pretty optimistic. I felt good reading this chapter because it's like, yeah, there's all these different ideologies, but, you know, everyone, like, I think it's comforting to, to think that everyone wants the same ends. That was like, reassuring. Like, there's not, not enough, like, I, maybe, I think every political debate or debate should begin with coming up with an agreement on the ends. Yeah. Because you, um, like, that's something people share. Yeah, and he'll probably get into asking questions about this, but it, it what stu stood out to me the most is about how people, separate from politicians, want good ends mm -hmm. and they don't care how they arrive at them generally but the politicians are the ones who are wedded to the ideologies because they've like they they've made their careers on it yeah. and they need to make sure that they don't look wrong or bad because they're like I espouse this ideology but the people just want the good ends so mm -hmm. if they can be persuaded that this other ideology or this other way will produce the ends better then they could switch, and it, it was uh, it, encouraging to me to um, approach politics this way, mm -hmm. um, at least like small town politics, like convincing people maybe banning plastic bags won't produce the end that you want, or the, the banning straws or whatever mm -hmm. they want to do. Anyway, um, what is the definition of a party? I remember they clearly defined, he clearly defined this, um, and I was like, oh, that's interesting, but I, I forget exactly the definition used. Hopefully, Robert Murphy. So it says, every party promises to deliver economic prosperity, peace, a reduction in disease, and so forth. Thus, their di disagreements are not over abstract principles on which compromise is impossible. In contrast, the truly religious wars, when it comes to secular ideology, conflict is their hope for cooperation, because human society is the great means by which all people can better achieve their different objectives. What was that last sentence? In contrast, the truly religious wars, when it comes to ideology conflict, there is hope for cooperation, because human society is the great means by which all people can better achieve their differing objectives. Yeah, it seems like um, a party is the embodiment of an ideology. Mm -hmm. It's a group of people who all have the shared means to an end. Right. Comment, the main objective of praxeology and economics is to substitute consistent, correct ideologies for the contradictory tenets of popular eclecticism. 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 <laughs> um, what is a monetary crank? Hmm. Gee, I don't remember that. I don't either. How can we fight error? I don't think monetary crank is in there. I really... I don't remember that. I don't think that it really fits. I think that might be a typo. I, that, I would like it. I don't recall it. Yeah. Um, but I do remember this, might. What is might? It is the ability for a person to influence the actions of others, right? Mm -hmm. I thought through force, or is no? I didn't not. think. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, it was not necessarily through force. Maybe it is, but I I thought that might it was uh, independent of. It was in the context of talking about yeah. force, but I think a person can have might with um, other forms of influence, right? I agree. To what does someone owe his might? So, I mean, mm. one could be force. Yeah. He's very strong. Um, the other is... So I guess 
its followers, I guess, or the people behind you. He talked about, um, you know, the, the gangster could rob just an individual, but that's not, that's not going to last unless he has um, the majority behind him eventually. Like a minority rule, like a minority can rule for only a period of time. But if a minority was going to stay in power, they usually aligned with the, the older ruling class and kind of created this. So I think the power behind might is the majority sharing his ideology. Here is ideology being in the majority. That makes sense. It gives the example of India and the British rule over India and how um, the people accepted... British rule over India because they solved more problems than they cost. <laughs> um, and I, I thought about it in the context of the American Revolution, of how the uh, people who created a new government in mm. the colonies um, basically recreated the old government and were just like, you know, this is what you're used to, right guys? You like this. Mm -hmm. So there, it wasn't like a totally new thing. So they got might from people's uh, consent, I think. I don't know. I'm not a historian, but I, it seems like they got at least enough consent that there wasn't an issue. Right. What is the difference between a government that... Oh, okay, you just uh, answered this question. What's the difference between a government that uses violent oppression and a gangster who overpowers a weaker person? So, yeah, the government has the... Generally, the government will have the ideology of the people on its side, or the majority of the people. Yeah. Or, um, I think they when the gang they talk about the gangster in this concept. It's a gangster without a gang, or a gangster without. Well, every so people, um, Tony Soprano and Nancy Pelosi might do the same thing to a business, take money from it. But people believe that Nancy Pelosi has uh, moral authority to do what she right. does, whereas everyone agrees that Tony Soprano does not. That's a good, that's a good point. So, can minority rule endure? Minority rule. And I, I think the answer is no, because so the minority can take over. Um, maybe they have better technology, they have better weapons, but they talked about how. Um, that won't last, like eventually um, they'll catch up with technology, the majority will catch up with technology. So the only way for a minority to stay uh, in power is to have the people adopt their ideology. Like yeah. People need to buy in. They have to manufacture consent. Right, like they can take over and that can be for like a little bit, but they talked about, you know, the dictator or the the ruler has like it has two two main things. It's the the morale of you know the people under him, and then that they share their ideology. I think those were the two. But that makes yeah. sense. So no, a minority rule cannot endure. No. They they say there's a great quote. Um, you can do everything with bayonets except sit on them. Meaning, uh, you know, you can you can take over people, but after a while, it's it's not going to last. You can't. Right. <laughs> um, meliorism and the idea of progress, huh? So, what are the definitions of progress and retrogression? Progress and retrogression. Okay, yeah, we touched on this at the beginning. That um, progress. I don't have like a, I guess maybe is there a good definition in the study guide? Because I, what I recall about it is that um, like with evolution, one can objectively claim progress um, because the ends are better attained um, by the innovations that have occurred. 
unless you argue that like uh, child mortality rates um, right should be it's, increasing it's your, <laughs> like, but it's on your own value judgments on whether it's better or worse so you yeah but like it's ridiculous to get to claim that you want more uh, disease and but childhood that's, death and like but that's an individual value judgment that I mean probably everyone shares but it seems universal it seems to be you know, like I, I can't I can't imagine someone would say that and yeah. that, that has to be retrogression right but the scale of good or bad is different from everybody yeah and to say something can you say something is objectively good I don't think you can. I think you can if it can be universally applied. For example, uh, it's universally good to... So let's just like take your child mortality example. Yeah. Um, that sounds like an alarm, but it's not my alarm. So objectively, child mortality rate, is, like the lower it is, the better. But like, what if there's a scenario in the human population where, like, it, it happens in animals all the time. Like, animals, like frogs, have hundreds of eggs because their mortality rate is so high, and like, there's a there's a risk of overpopulation. So like, if child mortality rate is always uh, good like having is there could be a scenario where it's bad it causes overpopulation and more people die because of that maybe you're right so like I think I could be wrong but I think that idea of progress is really based on your ideology was did Mises make a distinction between um, confusing progress with uh, change like I remember him saying something to the effect of long term you look at life and it's that's progress but short term you look at small changes and you can't be sure if it's progress mm -hmm. I mean I don't know but is, yeah. is there anything in the notes about this Okay, so the notion of progress and retrogression only makes sense in the context of an actor's plan. Evolution is the biological sense is purposely and hence it is impermissible to view creatures as gradually improving over time and turning into higher forms of life. Oh, so, so I had it completely wrong. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and because, and then, so it's kind of a common thing. So the fatal flaw in the 18th and 19th century rationalists and classical liberals was their faith in the decency and wisdom of the common man. So you can't make the argument that because all the common man think that uh, that you know decreasing um, child mortality rate is good. That doesn't. That doesn't just mean it's progress, because okay. that was a fatal flaw. Here's another uh, comment in the technical notes section. When Mises writes on page 192 that one must guard against the incorporation of the idea of progress in biological evolution, he is limiting himself to the scope of what the natural sciences can teach us. The accepted modern statement of Darwinian theory holds that it is a naive confusion to view evolution as a billion-year process in which homo sapiens are eventually reached without 
positioning an actor, such as God, who designed the process, there is no goal, and hence the term progress is inapplicable. Hmm. So it's progress towards an end, um, and without an actor, there can be no progress. In the present day, bacteria can certainly thrive in many areas of the planet, and so, from a purely biological viewpoint, there is no sense in which humans are more evolved than the bacteria are. Right. Mm. That makes sense. Like, it's consistent with everything in this book, as in, there needs to be an action and an actor to achieve an end. So it's like... To know, call something progress. Right. So progress towards what? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Toward what end? Men ear very often. How is this compatible with democracy? Comment. There is but one yardstick for the appraisal of human action. Whether or not it is fit to attain the ends aimed at by acting men. And I think he talked about, you know, the flaws of de democracy as in you know, the common man, or the majority, can be wrong. And so, you know, they teach you in public schools that, you know, democracy is like the end-all, be-all, it's, it's the best, and it's like designed to achieve the best outcomes. But that's not true, because the majority can be wrong. Mm, yes. They don't really offer a solution. Because it's, listen, all right, what's a solution besides a democracy? Who doesn't? Mises. What's the what's the solution besides democracy? Yeah. Self rule. Instead of rule by the many. Right. Rule by one. Um, since democracy allowed the direct rule of the many. These enlightened thinkers considered social progress inevitable. What they failed to predict was that the masses were quite fallible and could fall sway to horrible ideologies. Yeah. If I've learned anything from Mises, it's that the person or the actor who has the most to gain or lose is the person who will make the uh, most informed decision um, and those who have nothing at stake will take the least effort to uh, learn what the best outcome will be and so mm -hmm. um, no one could have a higher view uh, of what would benefit an individual than that individual. And therefore no person could be more fit to decide how to live one's life than that single person. Right. Okay. Oh wow, we have another we have another section here. Well yeah, this we've one's got short though. Like twenty minutes left. So yeah, okay, it's just a few questions. So this is chapter ten. Exchange within society. This made me laugh. Autistic exchange. <laughs> I was like, what? Uh, An interpersonal exchange. But is that really, is that the definition of autistic? Um, what is the difference between an autistic and an interpersonal exchange? So an autistic exchange is uh, exchanging things, uh, offering something up without the expectation of a return. Or I think also... Like, an autistic exchange would be a hunter going out and um, giving up leisure for food. Mm -hmm. So they're not, they're not getting reciprocation from an exchange without any reciprocation from an individual. Right. They're not trying to influence another. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm offering you an envelope of cash and saying, mm -hmm. hey, wink, wink, vote this way... I'm giving something in expectation of a, a change of behavior. Right. Is exchange a win-win situation? Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. Why? Uh, uh, 
piece of the an individual unless the exchange is forced, an individual wouldn't make the exchange if they didn't um, if they valued what they had more than what they're getting. Makes sense. Um, I just I really kept thinking about um, in this sense. Uh, it, it's interesting the the Bitcoin network growing, mm-hmm. and how. Like, in the early days, they talked about, not in Bitcoin, but just in general, uh, like, humans' first exchange were all autistic. And then when they uh, evolved, they started doing these interpersonal exchanges. Yeah, dumb d- dumb exchanges, or something they called them, right? Where there's no speaking? Right, and more, there was more, you know, picking berries or hunting. It's an autistic exchange. Yeah. But that, so, like, that's kind of, like, what the network for Bitcoin is now. It's a lot of autistic exchanges of people trying to better, like it's very primitive and people, you know, writing code or contributing kind of, that's the same version of like off the land. Um, And it hasn't evolved to the point where there's a lot of interpersonal exchanges within it. Mm, Interesting. Hey Steven. Hello. Good morning. I um, filled up the coffee machine, so you just push the start button and it will make a fresh pot. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so contractual bonds and hegemonic bonds. Why does a contract imply mutuality? Uh, because, of, as you just said, yeah. to the win-win situation of exchange, um, contract is mutually beneficial or the two people would not enter into it. Does a state imply hegemonic or organization? This I don't know. I don't know about the, the definition of hegemonic. I was a little confused about that because it seemed like it was used in this chapter as a substitute for family. And I don't know if that's, maybe I should just look up the straight definition. Ruling or dominant in a political or social context. The bourgeoisie constituted the hegemonic class. Okay, so I'd say yes. Yes to the question. Does the state imply hegemonic organization? Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. it does. So, in what way did contractual relations help to form human civilization? Um, human civilization is, is entirely formed of contractual relations. Uh, otherwise, I mean, Nisi says in earlier chapters that <clears throat> human society. Um, humans wouldn't exist without society, that we're totally social creatures, and that we um, depend on one another for um, specialization and trade. Um, So this type of trade, these contractual relations, form the basis of human civilization. What distinguishes a Reichstadt from a (laughs) Wolfstadt? Gee, I don't know. <laughs> what? Do you know? No. Um, I'm going to have to take a pass on this because yeah. I don't see it in the notes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember I don't those words. Yeah, neither do I. Okay. Cumulative action. What is the relationship between action and non action? Explain. No other distinction is of greater significance both for human life and for the study of human action than between calculable action and non-calculable action. So they talked about economics being um, so the distinction between calculable and non-calculable action is a is of the utmost importance. Modern civilization is possible only because people have learned how to apply arithmetic to so many different fields. 
Economics itself may be described as theory of that scope of human action that relies on calculation. Uh, so calculative action. Um, all action uses ordinal numbers in the sense that possible outcomes must be ranked on the scale of values to determine which action will result in the highest possible satisfaction. The use of cardinal numbers in action requires special conditions. It was in the context of a contractual society that the use of arithmetic as an aid to action developed. So it's like, oh, you, I want to uh, contract with you to produce 50 units of X right. per day in exchange for 100 units of why mm -hmm. and then it's not just like cardinal uh, or ordinal numbers like ooh I want you to produce this the most it's we're gonna f nail down exactly how much is we can expect from each other right why is economic calculation so fundamental I think no what, what were the words because uh, Modern civilization is possible only because people uh, learn to apply arithmetic right. to so many different fields, like economics. Ta-da! That was great. Chapters 9 and 10 complete of human action. Cool. Next, and part 2. Next chapter... Oh, that was part 2 complete of, yeah. what, three parts? How many parts are there? Um, I think... This part must be huge, then. I think there's more than three parts. Okay. There must be. This is... But three would be a nice, clean number. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there's uh, a lot more. Okay. So I, I actually think part four is pretty short. It's three chapters. Uh, and then... Uh, well, chapter 11 is valuation without calculation. So that's interesting. Can't wait to see what that's about. Okay. Because there's... So the next part is three parts, so either this time or next time, I think we should do two chapters. Okay. I'm just trying to see which one would probably go best. So, the third chapter is very short. Yeah. So maybe next, not so maybe one chapter this time and two next. That sounds good to me. Let's do that. Okay, so chapter eleven. Great. Chapter eleven: bankruptcy. Oh, is that what it is? 